Thanks for coming out and watching the oxymoronic Reddit professional show, where I showcase the best and worst of the internet. Here I comment on brilliant and hilarious comment chains regarding dumb shit on the internet for you to enjoy. Make sure to subscribe, hit the little bell button so that you get notifications every time we come up with a new video. Enjoy this week's show. Medical professionals, what has been your most gory, disgusting, or worst medical experience? I volunteered as a nursing assistant at the local hospital. On the first day I was there, I was asked if I'd like to assist in bathing an elderly patient. I was told that he was near comatose, riddled with cancer, and was on death's door. I agreed, but nothing could prepare me for the sight of him. His pallid skin was stretched over his bones, and his eyes were dull and staring. Most of his skin was purple where his blood vessels had ruptured. He couldn't even speak and screamed when myself and the other nurse had to roll him over. He was constantly injected with morphine because of the pain. Two days later, he passed away. I decided the medical profession wasn't for me. I'm a nursing student. We just finished our medical clinic placement at a nursing home. Not me, but my friend did something ridiculously funny. She was dressing a man, and while pulling his pants up or down, he started to do a really big poo. So she put her hand out under his bum and caught it. The other nurse starts laughing her head off at my friend standing there with a huge poop in her hand. She asked her why she didn't just let it fall to the floor, and all she could say was, I panicked. Autopsy tech and death investigator. A morbidly obese man had died in a cheap motel room with the heat cranked up and wasn't found for several days. By the time we got him to the morgue, he was horribly bloated from decomp gas and was purple and green all over. There was lots of skin slip. Our forensic pathologist went to make the initial Y incision and the force of the escaping gas blew gore all over us in the ceiling while making a sound like a wet balloon with air being pinched out. We all paused for a moment as the worst stank I have ever smelled enveloped the room like something that had crawled out of Satan's anus. Then we burst out laughing because it was all we could really do. It didn't help that he was leaking liquefied fat all over the floor, that stuff is slippery. My boots have never been the same since. Mortician for four years before switching to nursing for the pay increase. 24-year-old kid who take a boatload of pills and passes out in a field or wooded area, being his parents' home, aspirated, and naturally then passed. Went missing mid-July, found mid-September. We're in South Texas. Went to box him for cremation and lowering him from the stretcher to the box. My gloves slip from the plastic around him being wet with body ooze, and he drops down the last six inches. Sploosh. Droplets of pure brown nastiness went everywhere. The absolute most pungent decomp I have smelled to date. As a paramedic, responded to a call of traffic accident, baby ejected. We prepared for the worst we could imagine. Arrived in about eight minutes, trooper on scene trying to clear the area of bystanders and gawkers, and preserve the scene. He had covered the baby with the yellow death sheet troopers carry in their trunks, lifted the sheet to check the vitals, pronounced death, and it was not a baby, but the top half of the 19-year-old girl that was driving the small pickup truck about 50 yards away. She was driving and arguing with her 19-year-old husband, who was the passenger. They were doing about 55 miles per hour on a two-lane road and met an an oncoming truck pulling a double wide mobile home. She ran under the front corner of the mobile home, cutting her in half. Her bottom half remained in the driver's seat while her unhurt husband watched as the truck skidded another 50, 60 yards, sideswiping a minivan, sending it into the ditch upside down. When the truck came to rest, her bottom half fell out onto the ground. We also found a trail of ribs from the cab to the bed and down the pavement to the top half. It looked like a movie set. Her top and bottom looked unhurt, but from mid-chest to about pelvis was strung along the road. The husband was absolutely freaking out about what he had just seen. He was babbling incoherently, running around, swinging at people, just a mess. A witness who lived right in front of the scene started having chest pains and had to be transported. We took the husband, and I called medical control and actually got orders to give him IV Valium, something paramedics normally can only give for grand mal seizures. The driver of the big truck was fine, but was also very, very distraught at what he had just witnessed. That was 16 years ago, and I can still remember pulling up to that scene like it was yesterday. Emergency nurse here. This, so far, is the only death I've experienced from work that I've lost a significant amount of sleep over. 24-year-old male walks, again, walks into the ER with complaints of flu-like symptoms for the past three days. He had decided to come in that day because he started to develop a rash throughout his body that he was unfamiliar with. Sadly, this rash was actually the result of a failed battle with bacterial meningitis, causing him to bleed internally and externally. By the time we got him back into the ER, he had started crying blood, and the terror in his eyes was palpable. 
He went downhill fast, his lucidity diminished with his blood pressure, and the last thing he said before succumbing to pulseless VTAC was something about his mother that we could not make out. You could see his consciousness fade from his eyes as we started compressions. The code lasted close to an hour. At first, we could still keep his oxygen levels up with mechanical ventilation, defibrillation, and drugs, but blood was filling his airways faster than it could be suctioned out. He was bleeding too fast for any medications or fluids to keep his blood pressure up. He died soaked in blood and nearly unrecognizable due to his now almost uniform purple skin and swollen face. We later found out that he was studying neurobiology, had a devoted girlfriend that was all for intents and purposes a fiancé, a large family, and many friends. He was an athlete who lived healthy. He had beautiful, curly hair. This made the death tragic in a way that you just don't experience when an 80-plus year old dies. It made the unanswered pleads to God for help that had been sent echoing around the room by his family all the more bitter. I helped drag and push him into a body bag. In my EMT class, an instructor was telling me about one of her calls to a freeway accident. There were two cars involved, and one of them had an elderly couple in it. Since she was so small, my instructor is often assigned to the job of crawling through the windows of the car to stabilize patients, while the crew works on prying the doors open. She crawled into the backseat of the elderly couple's car and held manual C-spine for the woman, holding someone's head in place to prevent an injury by twisting the spinal cord. As she held the head, it came off in her hands. The woman had been decapitated by the accident. She had to take a couple of weeks off after after that and talk to a therapist to help cope. I can't imagine what it must have been like to go through something like that. A few years back, when I was a medical student, I was doing my primary care rotation when I had to see a morbidly obese lady for a gynecologic issue. She said she was having a lot of itching and soreness in her vagina. Even as I set up for a pelvic exam, I could already tell it wasn't going to be good. I could smell a foul odor already and I haven't even looked. I was gloving up when I got so nauseated and I was about to get sick. So I excused myself and lied to my attending that I had a problem taking a look in her because she was so obese and I didn't have much experience with such a challenge. The truth was I just couldn't stay in the room. It smelled like rotting vagina. A few minutes later, my attending calls for me to show me what he found. I thought for sure it would be an aborted fetus, but I was wrong. I go in with my mask and there my attending dangles this cylindrical object covered with bloody debris. It was a tampon. She apparently had difficulty removing it a week ago. My attending kept saying, it stinks like a mag. The embarrassed patient was crying and I felt bad, but I had to step out of the room because I was starting to regurgitate my saliva and was about to puke. To this day, I can't forget that smell. It took a few weeks before I was able to go down on my girlfriend again. I think that was my deciding factor as far as not going into gyne. I just don't want to encounter the rotting vagina smell ever again. A 70-something-year-old woman came into hospital with extreme abdominal and vaginal pains, so they first did a physical exam by pushing their fingers into her vagina to see if anything wasn't right inside. Well, as he pushed his fingers through, they stopped at a wall just a centimeter or two within. He was so confused to why the depth of her vagina was so small. The other two doctors also examined and were just as confused. They ended up doing an x-ray and it showed that her uterus was the size of a freaking basketball. Turns out that every period she's ever had has been stored in her uterus. They evidently had to cut it open, but when they did, 70 years worth of period blood came gushing out like an explosive diarrhea. The room was filled with black-brown stale period blood, and the smell was apparently incomprehensible. They spent a solid time throwing up after that. I want to tell this story because I feel there is very limited knowledge about when it is appropriate to withdraw care on your family. If any of you take anything away from this, please write a living will and talk to your loved ones about your wishes. A man brought his 92-year-old mom to our hospital because we were renowned for our outcomes. She had some pneumonia and was placed on a breathing machine to help breathe. Numerous antibiotics and drugs were given to help the lady as her son wanted everything done. She stayed on our unit for weeks, breathing and eating through tubes with incredibly advanced dementia. Every time we came into the room or spoke to her, you could see the fear in her eyes. Every time we had to turn her vent settings up as she got closer to dying, we talked to the son about withdrawing care. He denied. Never. This was his mom, and he did not want to let her go for any reason. He started yelling at the staff, and we had to escort him out a few times. Yet, since he was appointed as the decision maker in her living will, we had to continue to ask him to make decisions about his mom's care. When his mom was literally days away from death, maxed out on every drug we can give, we asked him to withdraw care on his mom. He punched me in the face. Later that day, we performed CPR on his mom, breaking four of her ribs, and she died anyways. The rest of the family watched us do this in horror to their mom because the son could not withdraw care. When you are appointed to make decisions in a living will, it can only be up to you. We could have withdrawn care weeks earlier, giving her a peaceful and restful death. If we are all going to die eventually, we should have the respectful choice to decide when we no longer wish to be cared after. It is therapeutic. Sometimes enough is enough. 
This is not my story, but my father's. My dad was on his way to go pick up some pizzas from one of our favorite pizza places. He had just turned down the T intersection towards the pizza place when he heard an extremely loud crash. He turned around just in time to see a motorcycle helmet coming down from about 30 feet in the air. The driver of the motorcycle had just ran the red light and slammed right into the side of an SUV with two teenage girls all dressed up on their way to prom. The guy was driving way too fast, especially seeing as how you can't see the intersection until you are almost right on top of it. When he hit the side of the SUV, his face hit right at the bottom of the window at the driver's side rear door. It threw his helmet off straight up into the air, shattered the window, left a huge dent in the door, and covered the interior of the car and the poor girls in their white prom dresses with specks of blood. My dad pulled over in a nearby parking lot and rushed over to help. At this point in time, a couple of people had already gotten out, but due to the man's condition were just standing there in shock. The man had taken almost all of the force of the crash directly to his face around his jaw. At this point in time, he was laying in the middle of the intersection with blood streaming from his mouth. He was in bad shape but was still trying to breathe. My dad saw this and attempted to clear his airway. He used his fingers to scoop out enough blood from the man's mouth so he could breathe and then attempted to pull his tongue and jaw down to open his airway. He described the man's chin as literally having absolutely no structure, as the bones had been pulverized. He compared the feeling of this man's jaw to a handful of mush. He continued to stabilize the man's neck and hold open his airway until the ambulance arrived. It took the ambulance a good 10 minutes to show up, and had my dad not been there to help, this guy surely would be dead. He let the paramedics know his name and that he was an anesthesiologist and gave them a quick rundown about what he already knew. Once the man had been taken away, my dad decided it was now time to wash off. He walked a short distance to the pizza place. His forearms were pretty bloody at the time, and he said it was quite amusing seeing the look on people's faces as he asked them to open the doors to the pizza place and restroom with arms covered in blood. He washed up, grabbed the pizzas, and came home. The man ended up suffering multiple fractures in a couple of different vertebrae, an almost non-existent jaw, and other facial fractures, broken collarbone, broken ribs, collapsed lung, amongst a slew of other things. Now my dad, having worked in a hospital for almost 20 years with an extremely busy emergency room, really did not think much of this at the time. He was simply doing the kind of things he does on a daily basis, just outside of the normal environment. I myself did not even hear about the situation from him until two days later. Now this is the thing about this that I find the coolest about the whole story. Fast forward a year, one year to the day of the accident exactly, my dad is at work when he gets a page to come down to the main lobby. As he comes into the lobby, he notices this man standing there and thought he looked kind of familiar. Without much hesitation, the man comes up to my dad, wraps his arms around him, and just starts bawling. My dad instantly realized who this man was and started crying himself. The man repeated over and over under the tears, Thank you. You saved my life. They continued to chat a little bit about the man's physical therapy and how it was going. I do not think they have kept in contact, but my dad said it was one of the best experiences in his life. One of the most horrifying things I have ever seen in the hospital was a guy who OD'd on one of his prescription medications. One of the side effects was priapism, which is an erection lasting for more than four hours. Once the doctors got his cardiac and respiratory systems relatively stable, they tried to get rid of this poor dude's erection, which was starting to turn purple, black, and blue. After several non-invasive methods, they did what they had to. They had to inject drugs directly into the head of his penis. Not one shot, not two or three or four, 19. 19 injections went into the head of his penis. It was still swollen, bruised, and red two weeks later. I used to be a nurse's aide. I once had to put a very obese woman on the bedpan. She was only mid-40s, and I left. She put her call light on, and when I answered, she said that she was all done. I turned her on her side to remove the bedpan, only to see that it's empty. My first thought is that she had been mistaken about having pooped, but then I looked and realized that her butt cheeks were so massive, her entire dump couldn't make it the length of her cheeks and had gotten wedged in between them. I had to dig the entire load out of her ass by hand. It was only about two months into the job and it gave me some serious second thoughts. Med student here, a super obese, that's an actual medical term, woman comes into a clinic complaining of a foul odor that she's noticed. And yeah, me and the attending noticed it too. A smell somewhere in between rancid milk mixed with rotting fish and a disemboweled skunk swimming in garbage. We do the usual workup, take a good history, do a thorough physical as best as we can get. She is huge and has folds and folds of fat and skin draped all over her, including rectal and genital exam just in case there was some funky down there growth and run some simple labs. As me and the attending 
attending are discussing how we have no clue what's going on, the nurse comes out holding a green, soggy mush in her gloved hands and waves it in front of our faces. I nearly puked right there. Turns out the woman was using pieces of bread to soak up sweat by putting them in between her fat folds. Apparently she forgot about one of the pieces, which then stayed there to marinate in her juices for weeks, as estimated by the patient. I was sent in to see if there were any more hidden pieces. Luckily there wasn't, but having to lift up and search every fat fold was as embarrassing for her as it was disgusting for me. A guy was drunk fighting with his girlfriend and decides to light up some M80s and throw them at her. Well, he waits too long after lighting one and ends up blowing off his hand. He's brought to the AR, completely drunk, and having lost a lot of blood. We stabilized him and take him to the OR. While the hand surgeons are cleaning off his stump of a hand, me and the surgery resident are fixing all his chest wounds. One of the hand surgeons says, wow, this is a mess. Did anyone at the scene find his thumb? No one knows. We continued examining, cleaning, and suturing his wounds, and lo and behold, buried in a deep wound in his upper abdomen is two-thirds of the guy's thumb. If he hadn't been so fat, his thumb would have likely entered his peritoneum. If you enjoyed this week's effective way to waste time, hit that like button and subscribe for more content like this. If you are enjoying the series, leave me a comment below. A special shout out to the content creators. You frickin' rock.